Um, are okay. you guys getting anything? And uh, anything that says that you need to accept to participate? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great, good. All right. Uh, hello, Rena. My name is Tom Freitas, a, a commissioner on the Santa Clara Advisory Commission for seniors. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here, and uh, I look forward to a, a, a robust discussion. I, it's a, a great event uh, to be able to speak uh, directly with this city, and uh, I am pleased to have met uh, Rena. Great. Thank you, Tom. And thanks for being a commissioner who's going to have a, a unique perspective on this. So I really um, value your participation. Um, Rocio, if you could just give us a quick introduction to who you are. Hi, everyone. Rocio Molina here. I'm the Community Engagement Manager with Catalyze SV. We're a nonprofit locally who is really focused on community engagement. So we're really excited to participate today. Um, and I heard about this through an email that you sent us. Thank you, Rocio. And Alex? Hey, I'm Alex. I'm also with Catalyze SV, colleague of Rocio's, and we do a lot of work in Santa Clara and looking forward to seeing some reforms on this policy. Great. Thank you. And I'm Rena Brio. I'm the Assistant Director of Community Development. Um, thank you for being engaged in this. Rocio and Alex, you both have been um, diligent about wanting to see progress. Um, so really, thank you for your patience as well as, um, you know, just making sure that we keep moving along with this effort. So, um, and thank you, Tom, for joining as well and for anyone who could be watching later. Um, so just, I'm gonna put up a PowerPoint. I'm gonna share my screen and um, it's gonna go a little bit through where we are today, where we've been and where we're at. And this is not the end. Today is not the end. Uh, we're still in a process. So uh, today is really about feedback um, on where we currently are at and what people have thoughts on in terms of what we've developed to this point. Um, and so the city of Santa Clara has a adopted from 2017 um, an outreach policy and it's geared towards specifically planning applications. And so I always say planning applications slash development because sometimes people don't even know what planning is. But when the city reaches out um, to share information and get input from the community on development proposals, um, and that's going to provide both the applicants as well as the decision makers, you know, information about the areas of improvement, problems that could come up and really elevate community concerns. Um, that's really what, in a nutshell, the outreach policy is about big picture today. Um, and, you know, back in December of 2022, we held in-person and virtual meetings to kind of talk about um, some ideation, I think, around what could we do with this policy and what are the topics that really need to be rethought of um, and what are the current contemporary challenges that it needs to, you know, adjust for. So what is different today than in 2017? Because that was only, what, six years ago. Um, so the world has changed in a big way. But um, one, we have a policy that's been in, in place and we've learned from those experiences. So we've gotten some high level feedback from people through this process and specific feedback, which I've tried to capture really concisely, but I could get into deep, a lot of details on it. So essentially, I think community members often feel that when they're engaged with the process, the project has already been formed. It's already been quote unquote baked. And so they don't feel like they have an ability to really effectuate change. Um, they do feel they've shared in terms of, and of course I'm sharing with you all the critical feedback, right? Things to improve upon. Um, they feel that the communication isn't necessarily super transparent on an ongoing basis. They don't know when they give feedback, what happens with it. and when a project evolves or changes, they don't feel like they're in the loop about finding out. Um, and then it's also a little uncertain what people think they can ask about. Like, hey, can I tell this developer that I want X, Y, or Z? Can I tell them that they should just, you know, 
this is not a project we want in our neighborhood, period. Um, people don't have a good sense of when they can ask, what and when they can ask for, you know, different things in the process. So the process isn't completely transparent in terms of what the purpose of community input is. Um, the other thing that's really changed since 2017 in a big way is the state of California's housing laws. And so a lot of these laws that are in place today in the last three years um, have done a lot to change local control over housing and how housing is built. Um, really, so that, and, and I'm going to give some broad statements here, but there, there are a variety of different bills that have been passed um, that are law now that really limit cities' abilities to have discretion over housing projects under many circumstances. So, um, that does change kind of the flavor of when you invite someone to a community meeting and they think that that meeting and what they can effectuate change on um, is like other meetings they've been to. Um, it does create challenges because of the sort of expectations that are set um, with the community that, you know, everything's on the table like other projects. And that's actually not the case at all. So um, it is. Definitely that California housing laws have changed uh, the ability of local governments to have discretion on those projects. And that does affect how we ask the community to come out and give us input, or it should, it should, um, so that we don't have the level of frustration that people have with that kind of level of engagement that seems kind of un unclear to them. Um, and then obviously also since the pandemic, the rise, you know, the ubiquitous presence of remote meetings. So definitely in 2017, I don't think anyone had a remote meeting for a development project. And out of necessity, we had to. And it's been a question mark through this process. Is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Is this something we want to continue? So definitely in terms of getting feedback from the community, there is awareness about a lot of the benefits of remote meetings. You talk about eliminating remote meetings, I think people would be really, really upset about that. Um, there has been a lot of increased engagement and participation by the community because of the presence of remote meetings and the fact that often now we have people who participate in different parts of the city. Um, so when you know a project could be located um, say in the southern part of the city, but people from the northern part of the city participate and vice versa, because it's rather simple rather than them getting in a car and having to drive across town to, to participate. Um, not to say that remote meetings are perfect at all. Um, there's also, you know, times where an in-person meeting is the best kind of meeting you can have. So a remote meeting isn't a substitute for the richness of a conversation that can happen but it is trying to balance when is it best to have a remote meeting? When is it best to keep that open or to maybe prescribe something different than a remote meeting? So what is also different today, right? There's um, an increased awareness that by having the same approach for everyone, that used to be kind of the way that we looked at the world, treat everyone fairly, and that will set an even playing field for everyone. Um, the reality is, is that you do have to look at individual circumstances and how they're different because not everyone's gonna be able to participate equally if you give the equal resources. Um, you have to actually look at the unique resources in order to be inclusive of people who have either systematically been disenfranchised or just have totally different needs. So, I mean, I like this little cartoon. I think it's sort of indicative of what we're trying to say. Um, I think that we've spent a lot of time in the equality box where we're trying to you know, do everything equally for everyone. And I think we're trying to get more to the equity box where we realize we need different approaches for people based on their unique circumstances. And I think one of the things that uh, we're trying to propose here is actually specifically looking at language and um, how do we get to people who haven't participated because they have those kind of language barrier needs um, that we're not even communicating to. They don't even know what's going on because 
they're literally not getting the message. So our current policy, you can find on our website, and it really boils down to a, you know, uh, a series of activities that we're going to do based on the size of a project. Uh, and the only thing that different is different is the size of a sign, perhaps, or the radius of how far we notice out. Um, occasionally, we have determined now that you know when a project's small or if it's standard, then it doesn't need a community meeting. I'll just have to say that any project in Santa Clara that's in the standard category, we always do community meetings about. <laughs> so it was kind of awkward to have that as a potential. It's if you look at the uh, the legend here, it says it may be required for standard meetings. But the reality is in Santa Clara, you know, if we're building, oops, sorry, a project that has, you know, three, four, 10, 49, we're not going to build a 49 unit project and not do a community meeting. That's just, that's not what our community expects. So um, I just wanted to make a note of, of that. And so we've done some cleanup with this box, but we've also added some new things because really um, every type of project isn't the same in terms of like the process even and how we should approach the process. And that's all really, this is all kind of filtering the feedback that we've gotten from various people and also things like our housing laws. So yeah, this is our, you know, one size fits all, not, not really the right approach, right? Um, engaging on a duplex with the same tools and process as a, you know, large multifamily project or a large office development, you know, isn't, it's not a one size fits all. And it's not really just about the radius. And it's not just about the size of the sign on the site. It's maybe about a little bit more about how people think about the project and the kind of input they want to give. So really going to this policy, also trying to get at best practices here, you know, and I think Alex and Rocio, you're probably very aware of the hierarchies of engagement, you know, a lot of, you know, professional organizations um, as well kind of talk about this. Well, you have the ability, right, to start out with just informing people about what's going on and then bringing people in to say, hey, I like this, I don't like this, right? That's a little bit more engagement, then you have the ability to really have them give feedback and be much more involved in developing a project. So you're collaborating. And then really, is the community out there actually planning a project? Are they empowered to be the people bringing that about? And I would say in Santa Clara, when we talk about development applications, we've often been in the space of, I think, to do, I'm sorry, I'm seeing a dialogue box I'm trying to move here, um, of consulting. Um, and I would say that in Santa Clara, um, we're talking about planning applications right now. So it's a development proposal that's in front of us. But in Santa, what we do around empowering is in the space of when we do oops, some of our specific plans, um, we will have assigned a task force that um, is comprised of residents or stakeholders and always residents. And they get into the weeds of developing the plan, usually with a planning consultant. And the city staff is really there to support how they drive that ship um, or that bus or whatever, <laughs> whatever they're driving. They're, they're, they're in the lead seat and they're recommending ultimately to the city council, you know, what they want to see happen in that particular area of development. And I would say that in Santa Clara, our downtown precise plan really is about um, an empowerment process. Um, but when we talk about our development applications, today, they're definitely more in the consult role. An application submitted, we get some feedback. And I think, you know, just being transparent about where we are in this spectrum and having, you know, an interest to want people to participate, to feel that their participation is meaningful. What can we do to, to move up this spectrum where it makes sense to do it? And in some places, it doesn't actually make sense to do it. And I'm, I'll get to that in a second. So 
So why do we connect with the public now? Um, and that answer is not a one size fits all answer. It's not that dog going through the hole, right? It's really different based on the proposal. Um, so today, as I was talking about state housing laws, when we have a project that is a housing project in which the city has no discretion on it, um, and actually by state law, it has to be a ministerial approval. Um, I know that's kind of legal, legalese, but it, it's really a, are you meeting the code? If you're meeting the code, then it is approved. And there's, there's a whole lot of background behind why the state has these laws. But really that is why we're engaging the public. Why would we send out information on a community meeting? Because we really want the community to know that something's happening in their neighborhood. Um, there's still an opportunity for the developer to maybe be a good neighbor and hear feedback and make, make adjustments perhaps. Um, but it's not the role for the city at that point to try to actively elicit like, hey, tell us what you want, like or don't like. It's really, here's what's gonna happen in, and there's a development that's being proposed and let's talk about the time frame. Let's talk about any problems that you foresee happening and let's, let's address them. So it's more on the world of notification. Now, there are areas where we have projects that aren't about housing, um, that adhere to the city's general plan. Uh, and what the general plan is, it's, it's a, a process and a document that the city has gone through a whole visioning exercise around all the land use in the city to say, when a, pro a property redevelops here, this is the type of housing, I'm not, I'm sorry, this is the type of development we want here. Do we want housing? Do we want office? Do we want commercial development? So when there's a proposal for a project, that adheres to the general plan. Um, and it's not necessarily housing, then the city still has a lot of discretion. We still have the ability um, to talk about site design, to talk about architecture, to talk about a lot of things. Um, and it's not to re-envision like, hey, you know, there's an office building that's being proposed. I don't want office here. That's they're proposing something that matches the general plan. So it's not that kind of conversation, but it is about let's make this project better. Let's have it meet some of the things that um, you know, our community hopes for from either aesthetics or a functional perspective. And also to elevate any issues and so that we can resolve them. So that is really you know, a different spectrum. It's not notification. It's more, hey, we want consultation. We want collaboration. And then really when we have something that is being proposed that includes a general plan amendment. So someone says, you know what? We don't actually want what the city has envisioned on this site. We want something different. From a legal standpoint, the city has the most amount of discretion. The city can say, yes, you can get this land use change, but we want amenities here. Um, or no, we don't like this land use change, so we're not going to approve it. So there's a lot um, that isn't entitled. That's these are like sort of legal terms, but that allows the community really to understand. Hey, what do we really want to see on this site? This is this is like the opportunity for us to have some visioning on this site, and also to really talk about things that benefit people outside of that project, which we often call those community benefits. Like, hey, do we want a community center here? That's something that we could potentially ask um, depending on the size of the project. We could ask for things that are built into the project um, that would be part of a requirement that the city would have. Do we want wider sidewalks? Do we want, what are those other amenities that we want? Do we want retail here? Um, so those are things that can definitely happen when we have a general plan and amendment. And so that's more another level um, more about engagement, more about getting people into the process earlier. So when we talked about all these things that I'm still going to talk about, um, and there's going to be plenty of time for questions. And if you have, I, I would appreciate if you'd let me go through this, because some of these I'll, I'll talk about, and then I know you'll all have feedback on stuff. Um, so when we broke it down to, this is an outreach policy, realize that's kind of a simplistic statement about what outreach is 
And that really, it's not, we're not trying to accomplish the same thing for each project, right? We have some notification that we're going to do. There is outreach when we're more in the world of consulting. And then there's really also engagement when we can have those higher level conversations because people are re-envisioning the land use on a site. Um, and so the activities involved really include the things that we will continue to do, on-site posting, website posting. We are gonna add in very explicitly ongoing communication because um, I'm gonna talk about that later, that that's something that needs to be um, very, very clear in terms of expectations that the community can have on the city. Um, and then really depending on the size of the project, the use of social media and community meetings, and we'll get into that. And so really the purpose of notification, so this is when we have those projects that the city doesn't really have discretion on, their ministerial approvals, is to share information. The purpose of outreach is to receive feedback and to improve a project. And then the purpose of engagement is all of that stuff, plus like, let's talk about the land use itself. You know, are you, is going from office to townhomes, not townhomes, I'm sorry, office to industrial, the right use here? Um, and what are the things that can be of benefit to the community? Because um, the community is gonna know what are those immediate needs that this project could help actualize. Okay, so, so when we talk about general plan amendments, the ones that the community has historically had the most in, interest in um, is when we have a conversion of like say industrial or con commercial land to residential uses. And so sort of built into this is an understanding that when we have a project like that, where you're gonna, and you know, there are a lot of projects in Santa Clara like that, where we have commercial industrial conversions to residential or um, specifically, um, you know, we wanna add a couple of steps in our process so that we can engage the community earlier. So this is really trying to tackle the, the project survey baked, you know, issue. And it's really having the developers and, you know, quite frankly, it's really hard to submit an application to the city. The process that you have to go through, the amount of work and really what you need to submit involves a lot of due diligence. And so you can see why people invest a lot in a fleshed out proposal, because that's kind of where they need to be in order to submit an application. So what we're saying is, let's back up into this process, let's have them submit a preliminary application, which isn't going to require all those same things, It's like kind of bigger picture, tell us about the site, what you're planning to do, give us some renderings, and then hold a visioning community meeting um, before you submit an app application and get feedback on that preliminary application. This will allow the community to really kind of give more feedback before the project gets fully developed. Um, and, you know, are they headed in the right direction? Are they not? To really get a good pulse on what this proposal is. And then things that people can talk about, right? You can definitely say, I don't think townhomes are a good fit here. Or I don't think, you know, a six-story building is the right thing here. You know, those are things that you can bring up early on. And then you can propose. Um, you know, what would be an alternate best use? Or you can also talk about things like, this is the time to mention, right? Hey, we really need a, um, the thing that comes to mind most for me is community space, because that that's something that um, comes up a lot as um, a need. Or, hey, a, an exercise room that could be available to others. So um, I'm going to skip over this because this, this is kind of, I, I talk over the contents more in a little bit, and I, I want to make sure that you guys have time to talk more than you've had any, really. So um, really, we're trying to increase language access, but we're trying to do it in a way that can also right, be the right use of, re of resources. Um, so language, right, today, um, it's hard for people to express, you know, that there's a language barrier because they have a language barrier. They're not even reading the materials and they're only one or two languages that we might send out 
or there's translations on it. So um, what we are going to do is actually create a website that is going to be the landing page for all of planning activity. And that's going to explain at a really high level what planning is, what are applications, and then also have languages translated that we have in Santa Clara, some of the most common languages that are non-English speakers. Um, so there are common languages in the city, but then there are languages where we actually know there are a lot of people who don't speak English. They, they don't just speak this alternate language, they also do not speak English. So we're gonna um, be able to create customized messaging for um, a variety of different languages that we think are gonna be at the top. And that really people can then utilize Google Translate to get to some of our pages. And then also be able to connect to us directly on any unique language needs that they have for community meetings, for hearings, for whatnot. But just trying to leverage technology as well with recognizing that we need to be able to communicate a little better and clearly connect the dots for people. Um, I would also say that, you know, social media is like Facebook, Nextdoor, those are tools that the city utilizes a lot. They allow, um, you know, any user really to be able to find the people they're looking for. And around language, there are definitely um, media outlets. There's, you know, unique groups that the city could really say, hey, we want to have this community meeting notice go out to everyone who's Spanish speaking in the city of Santa Clara. And um, we can actually create those custom tools to target and get the information directly to those, those speakers. So that's not something we've done in the past. And that's something that we're proposing here. Um, I know a lot of people have concerns around targeting people with social media, but we're here, we're trying to do it to really just disseminate information so that they can participate if they want to. Um, virtual meetings. So once again, talked about virtual meetings being a good thing in terms of increasing public participation, but really in-person and hybrid meetings for things certainly like visioning meetings um, or you know, there are definitely projects that are very controversial that you need to have um, in-person engagement on. So that's something that um, it's hard. It hasn't been something we've been able to spell out very concretely. Um, so if people have thoughts on that, um, interested in it, for sure, interested in all your feedback, of course, but um, that it, it's more setting the expectation that we'll start with the virtual meeting, but more meetings could certainly be set up in a hybrid fashion or in an in-person fashion. I will express a concern about hybrid meetings. Um, not everyone's a fan of hybrid meetings because it it's like you are looking into a room. Um, if there was a lot of resources involved, you could have a staff person who actually moves the camera over to everyone. And we do that for things like our council meetings, but we just don't have city resources to be able to actually put spotlights on people. So it really often looks like you're, you're looking in as a bird's eye into a room. And um, that can be not super engaging for people. But the other thing is um, we don't necessarily have a lot of spaces that work really well for hybrid meetings. And so um, as technology improves, I think that's a, an area where, you know, there's a lot of a lot of opportunities for getting better with hybrid. But right now, in terms of where we are with technology and the resources involved, hybrid's rather difficult. So um, I think meetings where we are in person and maybe they're recorded, or meetings where we have them virtually, those I think are actually more realistic and more easily implemented. But I just wanted to, to share some of the challenges of what hybrid hybrid means for, for us. Um, so ongoing communication, just being more transparent about that we're gonna continue to communicate with people on, we get your email and we will update you regularly. We will send all the materials to you and that if plans are sent, you'll get those plans too. So that's just, you know, people don't know after they participate in meeting, 
that it's still going on. The process is still going on. So we will sort of set expectations so that people know that that's a rightful thing and that we will deliver on those expectations. Um, so on-site posting today, when someone submits an application, they are also obligated to put up a sign. You may have seen them um, around town where it says what the development proposal is. Um, so here, just keeping that process, but also adding in like QR codes um, because people often want to, you know, they, they see that sign goes up right when the project's applied for, um, but that rendering that they have up may look very different by the time we're a year into the proposal. The development, the description of that sign may be different. So the QR code will allow someone to kind of, you know, it's a step better with technology to see, oh, look at the website for the project. And oh, look, the project descriptions changed. So that's just moving it a little bit further with the technology we have. Okay, so there's um, a, a fair amount to, to talk about and other topics that I know I haven't covered. So just really happy to get input on what we've talked about. Tom or Alex. And I think Rocio might have had to drop off. But I did get a letter from her. So I know she has. I'm happy to defer to Tom. Yeah. Uh, the only question I have, everybody, is uh, <laughs> the one that's closest to me at the end of your uh, presentation was the QR code. How exactly would you see that working? Uh, where would that be found uh, and so on? And, uh, and, and how would we, as a, participant or a citizen, how would how would we implement that QR code? Yeah, and I think that's one of those things that, so we, a QR code allows someone with their cell phone to turn on their camera, like they're taking a picture, hover over that square and it yeah. links. We can also just write the link. Yeah. And people can like go on the website and have access to real time. Um, today, we have the sign and we have the description of the project. And those things are hard. They, they take a while to print projects. It's hard to always update those. Um, uh, oh, there's your, there's you. So they're hard to update, but a QR code allows somebody to just very quickly get access to that web page. However, someone could also just write down the web page or take yeah. a photo of the sign and go back at home and enter that in. Um, and so it's just trying to make it a little easier for people who utilize that technology. But if you don't use QR codes, and you know, I'm really one who knows like today we're gonna talk about QR codes and tomorrow they're gonna be scanning people's eyeballs. I don't really know. Like it's, you know, everything's evolving, right? So right. this is yeah. just today what people use, but it, it's certainly not the only way to access the information. It's just taking it to another, just using the one tool that we now have that makes it a little bit easier. All right, uh, thank you very, very much for that explanation. Oh, no. um, Virtual meetings, uh, again, we have trouble uh, with um, our meetings through the SAC, I call the Senior Advisory Commission. You get the virtual meeting. Uh, I'd like to see more hybrid meetings. Um, but uh, there is only one facility at the City Hall. Um, I think it'd be worth the investment uh, because I believe that these these uh, these type of meetings are so beneficial. I can do it at home and, and still be informed. I don't have to travel um, and save gas and all that. But um, this is a very critical part, and and uh, I think it should be brought out. To it's going to be useful for all our our, uh, our uh, managers and so on to get the word out. So I, I'm voting for that myself. And when you say that uh, voting for that, you mean hybrid? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the the, the fisheye effect is true. And uh, I think the city hall, of course, uh, should provide a room uh, as we do city council meetings where they, where they 
they can zero in on the individuals. So it's just more personal. Yeah, I you know, I totally hear you, Tom. The the challenge is really not as it is about the room because you do need there are only a couple of places where we can do that. City Hall um, council chambers is one of them. Um, the other thing is the staff. You need um, to be in to use the technology in those rooms. Um, it requires staff that have specific training um, and it's expensive equipment. So they don't just trust someone like me, for instance, to utilize it. So I right. think the bigger issue is really the staff resources on that. And like I said, I do think that this is a problem of today because I know that everything around hybrids kind of getting better, but I just wanted to share that that, but I definitely understand. Um, so for your, your folks, the folks that participate in the senior commission and that people you just know in general, are there people who are, do not participate virtually? Or that's generally, generally true, yeah, but, but that is part of the challenge uh, for me to uh, to advocate for seniors and to get them on board because uh, they're otherwise excluded from the very uh, important information that would benefit them the most. And so that is one of my key uh, mm -hmm. issues that I'm working on right now. And housing is, is a big one. I'm, mm -hmm. We're putting uh, I don't know if it's appropriate or not, but I want to let you know there's a, a housing uh, meeting that's going to take place on the 13th at the senior center at 10:30. Uh, we're we're uh, asking for seniors to come and uh, to participate with uh, Marcus. Uh, mm -hmm. Adam Marcus is going to put it on, and he's got his staff going to put it on. So I think it's a it's a I'm looking for a very successful, uh, well-populated uh, group. If we don't get that, uh, that'll be very disappointing to me. And um, again, the seniors are not, uh, in my opinion, getting uh, the information that's available to them because they're, they're shy to get on this technology that we're experiencing at this moment. So this is so convenient for most people. All you do is learn how to do it. So. That is one thing that we talked about, and I think it's going to be very important to advocate for that. Better. And I'm sorry, when you advocate, when you're saying, I just want to make sure I'm understanding, you're saying advocate for hybrid, better, meetings. hybrid yeah, meeting, hybrid meeting in person with virtual, right? That's yeah, what you mean with it. Uh, working towards simplifying and making it part of the normal pick up the phone type feeling a person would have to get to. Uh, communicate with the individuals um at one time we had the ability to and we probably do still do we must have a telephone number we could call in and just listen to this meeting uh, yeah that was, yeah that's so simple for most seniors and they get the basically the same information they don't have to see the faces uh, i like personal touch myself and this is uh -huh. as personal we can get so do you I think don't wanna, go ahead um, because actually, Tom, getting a phone number is something that is pretty easy Yeah. Um, for virtual meetings. That's like, I didn't include a number, but there was one assigned with yes. this meeting. Um, and I think I just didn't have, you know, the value of the information that you're sharing with me that people want to participate, you know, yeah. they don't want to participate in the, the virtual, right? They want to call a number. So, but yeah. do you think that that's, an adequate way to approach it where we always include a phone number or do you think no it really should be that we do hybrid meetings well i think it's a good way to approach it because you know baby steps type of you know little little things help uh the phone number and then before you know it i can learn how to get involved with us with a hybrid meeting uh and and then i find the pleasure in this this type of communication right now the seniors are so shy against this whole thing it, the, the the links are foreign to them they don't understand how to read them um, totally so it's 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 a somewhat of a barrier mm -hmm. and it turns them off and nobody likes to feel 
that they're behind the curve or less adequate than someone else. So uh, because of their knowledge and they tend to just shut it off. I can't, I'm not going to be on the internet. I can't do this. It's, it's, and so those feelings eliminate a good part of our population and the most, probably the most uh, common group that you're appealing to here. They should be, they should have voice in this, this change uh, that in our housing and what they would like to see in the facility. They, they should realize that they have a voice, which uh, right now they don't. And I think the amount of people showing up at this meeting is a good indicator of that. Uh, uh, so that's, that's, I don't want to get on my rant. But, yeah, no, no, this is all very helpful. Oh, good. That's about all I would say. So as far as getting to the hybrid level, um, you know, a phone number would be a good start. Maybe a better in explanation uh, uh, when these are posted to, to get into a meeting uh, so that it makes it more appealing rather than business-like. Uh, this seems to be a standard format, which we all, which I understand now, but at first, you know, there's a lot of slash marks and numbers and, uh, and acronyms that really don't uh, address, <laughs> they get the job done for people to understand. Sure. But with those uh, to know, I don't want to communicate at a simpler level. You know, it's like language. Uh, we, we can't communicate unless we speak the same language. And I think that's where we're at with technology that we have at hand. It's such a new language. We're eliminating a lot of our seniors. You know, I, I'm I'm a senior, so I can speak from from the heart. I experience the same thing. And I, um, so I just I just know it's a factor. So that's why I'm, I'm speaking out for them. I and I I don't want to uh, dwell on and make it all about hybrid meetings, but it it is. Uh, no, that's an important that's an important point for sure. So. Yeah. No Thank you. Swear. That's yeah. about it, really. When you was on board, I was, I That's was about all I have to say about that. Uh, I love your PowerPoint presentation, and particularly, I like the dog trying to get out through the door. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's a good one. I can imagine. You know what's it. funny, Tom, is I tried all sorts of like images, like what's a good image trying to describe this? And oh, you did. that was, that one was it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm Everything. glad to hear that you, you really gave it some thought. Because yeah, it, I did. it was very good. I even wrote in my notes, don't forget about the door. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's the memory aid right there. I mean, that it, it does, we don't, a lot of things, we, one issue doesn't fit all. And, and it's our job to, to help, communicate to all. I, I agree with that. And I do, uh, I must say the the idea of using Google um, for communication purposes is so needed. Oh my gosh. Wait, I I'm sorry, the idea of using? Using Google. To Google, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Different languages. I know. Um, it's, it's a so tool th and it's much better than what we've had, but it's not perfect. But it's definitely a tool that's there now that we should be utilizing. Right. Um, oh, the fact that we have really kind of discussed that, but the fact that we want the public to feel in the loop. I, I can't tell you how many times it, it goes through my mind that uh, my input, even though it's part of the public presentation or public uh, information my input is at the end of the day is not even looked at you know whether we you put a parking lot in or a grass area um, it ends up what the contractor wants it ends up you know it, it's just really not what the citizens want uh, that's i i don't know if that's true that's what is clearly defined um there should be a publication that shows how many people wanted one issue and and you know whether we have uh, benches out in, in a community area uh, or not i mean i would obviously say yes <laughs> more community the better uh, especially in these high-rise apartments that we have uh, 
the more we bring people together, the better off we'll have a, a real neighborhood. Um, and like I try to advocate for game tables, you know, a lot of good communities have game tables at the park and bring people out of their houses. And so that's, that's so important uh, to, to always think about getting them out of those small little cubby holes they live in into this beautiful space that we live in and the parks and tree shaded areas and comfortable you know nooks that people can gather in this is my dream world you know this is and i believe that they you can have small spaces that accommodate those needs someone that can sit back and just take a deep breath and appreciate their in this environment you know i i would i would always advocate for that trees is a big thing you know uh we get a bad rap because it requires so much maintenance, but uh, the benefits we get are are so much better. So that's where I'm on the trees. Um, you know, I I also think that uh, game areas that people uh, some people will advocate for or would like to see tennis courts. Well, that takes up a lot of space. We can do it in different ways. We can we can put bocce ball. Bocce ball is not even used. It's not, not one bocce ball court in, in Santa Clara. And when they put it out for a choice, people normally will vote against it because they don't have a knowledge what it even is. So they don't even vote, vote for it. They'll vote for something else. So bocce ball is a high one on, on my, my uh, list of exercise because it, it brings for at least four people together. You can do it with two, but obviously two people, two groups. Are, but it just brings people together. And before you know it, one will lead to many more. We just don't even have that. We don't even have that. And then, of course, pickleball. Pickleball is a big one. It's raised all over the country. But it, guess what? Santa Clara has no pickleball courts. <laughs> and I don't know how we get so far behind the curve. So these are the things that I'm shooting for just to get our seniors out, exercise, something as simple, play checkers, play chess. Uh, play bocce ball, you know, roll, roll the simple little game and, and have fun and laugh and, and, and be young again. Uh, but the thing is, our seniors are being too, because of COVID, we're, we, we really restricted our, um, and, and, and the rich seniors from getting out at all. There's very little activity that they can do. Mm -hmm. Exercise room is a good one. But again, that's just kind of an individual sport, you know, if getting on the machine and not talking to anybody, you know, it's just it's good for your metabolism. And I would always, I would always advocate for more exercise, but if I had a choice between a bocce ball court or, or any activity that would bring more than one person together, then I would shoot for that. Uh, you're giving me a lot of time here to talk. I don't know well, if I'm off I mean, the subject or no, not. You, but you, I, you, yeah, I mean, we can. I, I can throw it to Rocio, and you might actually be prompted by other thoughts, Tom, as she's yeah. speaking as well. Um, I love it. Rocio, I know you were great in sending me a good, thoughtful letter um, yesterday, um, but I don't know if there's anything you had like you wanted to... Yeah, Rena, thank you so much for that. Sorry, I had to plug in and my kid is in the background. But um, no one thing that I did want to mention that kind of came to mind as Thomas was speaking was um, that we also didn't see any language about la um, language access and interpretation access. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, that along with some of the points that he brought up about the virtual access really goes a long way to making people feel more comfortable. And one thing that we've done is maybe ask people along the way while they're registrating or, or while we're outreaching and connecting with people if they need language interpretation access. Um, we don't always offer it, but if we think you know, we're going to a neighborhood where there's various different languages spoken um, or any of the attendees express interest, then, then that's when we would uh, make those services available. So little things Thank like you. that you know, yeah. go a long way. And I know you can't bake everything into your policy, but I think um, having a view no, towards equity, like you mentioned earlier in, in your, the presentation would be great. I think Rocio, that's a, a really good suggestion. The way you presented it 
because as you were saying, it's really hard to uh, resource something with all the bells and whistles, but instead the way that you suggested it, actually asking as people register about those needs so that we can plan that accordingly. And it won't be every meeting or it might be in certain community areas of the community. But I think that's exactly. a really good, a good suggestion about how to do that. Thank you. And thank you so much for hosting this conversation today. I feel like I learned a lot from Thomas also about how to you know, connect with the senior community. We don't always make the phone number in our Zooms and things like that readily available, um, but I, I will definitely keep a special eye towards it now. Well, thank you very much. Um, Rocio, anything else that you kind of wanted to, to highlight at all? That is it for me. Thank okay. you so much, Rena. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, so, um, let me let me just go and Tom Thomas or Tom. Yes. Any anything yes. else that you want to add? Because I was going to talk about next steps. Next. Um, let me look at my notes here. Um, people can make the difference. I know that you mentioned that, and uh, uh, that needs to be punched up as much as possible uh, in in flyers and communication, uh, giving them the the power. The feeling of empowerment is is so important to seniors because they've been, um, I believe, a lot of our seniors have been down and out, feeling like, you know, um, they're they don't have the, the voice anymore. I, at least quite often that's what I get, and that's why you get a usually an angry senior that speaks up in such a way that they they don't they're not respectful and and uh, and they're dis, they're so disappointed. That they're not listened, being listened to. So um, this is just a phenomenon that doesn't doesn't occur with a younger person in how they present themselves. It's, again, it's a, it's a almost like a language issue. It's 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 a different world a senior lives in. So I just would uh, let you know that they're not well, all. Even angry. I think I think Tom though what you shared right is like definitely the perspective which is out there where people give feedback and then, oh, I guess nobody listened to me, right? But what people don't often see is that actually you gave feedback, it was explored. Yes. And there was all these things that happened and that maybe we got to an answer you don't like, but hey, there, it's not like we listened to you and we didn't do anything with it. And that's part of the story that I feel like we need to tell more. And I've been really wanting us and we've been doing this more also, like we will talk about how a project came in and then show that and then say, and then the community asked for this and this and this, and this is where it's at now. So that uh -huh. a lot of times we, we don't do that. We just talk about this is where the project is. And then people don't even understand that, oh, the reason why this is here is because you said something about it. Or people don't really know that. And I don't know if it's, it's usually not in a public hearing um, sometimes we'll write it in our staff report. We'll say people asked about this and this, and yes. these are the reasons why. But people don't read staff reports. You know, no. like, that's where the ongoing communication is. Is like, hey, you asked about the balcony. We looked into the balcony. Blah 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 blah. This is the answer on on where after we dived into it. Oh, you have like another idea. You know, so I think that's that ongoing communication rather than you participated in a meeting. Now it's over that you gave your input, it's the end. It, that, and right. that, it doesn't need to be that way. And it, it isn't always that way. It does kind of vary a little bit from staff and approach, but we just want to kind of clearly state what our practice is going to be about kind of ongoing communication and keeping people in the loop and more of the storytelling about how, what your input has led to, whether it's a change or not yeah. a change, but at least that it's been considered. Exactly. Maybe just a simple spreadsheet to show the pros and cons. Yeah, really, that's a good uh, idea, actually. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I love this this type of communication because you know you're you're the final decider, you might say, but the public uh, should feel as part of it, and this brings our community together. It is as part of a giving each individual a voice and feeling like they're part of it. 
and not communicating that is is just like I say, it's it's not good for an individual to think that they're being ignored, which no, may, no. may not be. And, mm -hmm. and it always comes up that way, you know, it, 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 mm -hmm. you have to tell that person that, you know, you're not being ignored, they're, they're, they're doing it the best way they can. Anyway, back up, I don't wanna keep ranting on that, but that's a very important feedback. It's important for anybody. Um, so I have a few more things, I'm not a few. Uh, I guess that's about it. I can't. I can't see okay. collaboration. Collaboration is is paramount. Uh, is you know it, we all do better with three or four voices rather than than one person making the decision. So the, we and you know I my wife I guess mad at me because I'm always going down the street looking. Oh, that could be done better. That could be done better. You know this and that. And, uh, you know, uh, again, um, why do I, as a citizen, say that, you know, something can be done better where I'm not even, I'm not the expert. So, uh, but it's one of these common sense things. Why, why uh -huh. did they, you know, and so it's, however, I'll go to other communities and, and, uh, and I, I'll, all the time, you know, you probably heard this, but we compare our communities. And when you cross a when you cross a, a border into another community and you find that uh, the same I issue is done better, I kind of wonder why are we going to different schools? Uh, are we not talking to each other? So uh, I just I always stand for the highest highest standard we can find. Uh, always uh, money is no issue. Pare it down if you have to. But shoot for the best we can find, and um, that's all I can say on that subject. So I, I hope the city maintains a very high standard that we shoot for the stars and we get the best for for our community, and not let let um, oh limitations like uh, you know finances. I mean, yeah, we all need more money to do something, but at least uh, put it in the and the choice, and then negotiate with it. But always put the best in first. That's all I had to say. Thank you, Renee, for listening to me. Great. Yeah, no, that's good, Tom. OK, so I am going to move to the what's next. Hmm. Why am I not? Oh, there we go. OK. So uh, I'm going to post this meeting material. This video is going to get posted. Um, we already have the policy up on the website, so you can read it. Uh, the main topics I've talked about today, um, and um, we are going to go to the Planning Commission for their recommendation, and then to the City Council for approval. That would be the process. So that's timing out to you know here we are already in the summer, so it's probably you know early fall um, where we would be in those those two hearings. And, um, you know, you have my contact information here. We have another meeting next week to get any feedback from anyone else who would like to participate. Um, and so if other people, if you, you know, invite other people or I'm, we're gonna still continue to push this out um, to get more feedback, but people can also email me directly or go straight to the website and put comments in. We have a particular, um, software that lets people indicate, you know, things that they want. But by you sharing all this with me today, um, I've got this all down. So you don't have to necessarily put those same comments into the document unless you want to. Okay. Um, so with that, um, any other final thoughts before we close? Well, I just want to thank you both um, and Alex too. Thank you so much, Rena. Yeah. Yeah, no, thank, thank you, Rena. Rocio. And thank you, Tom. Um, My pleasure. I look forward to talking to you both um, about other things or about this in the future. Yes, look forward to meeting you in person. Yes. Yeah. Okay, have a good yeah. night. Good night. Goodbye.